Last month, I bought a Tesla Model 3 Performance so that I could make videos talking about how poor Teslas are without being criticized for it or being accused of not knowing what I'm talking about. Just kidding, sort of, but for real. For those of you who are longtime viewers on my channel, you've probably come to realize that over the years, I've been a pretty big critic of Elon Musk and Tesla as a whole. And this has not been met without criticism from you guys. And I strongly believe that during the pandemic highs of Tesla, Tesla vehicles were way too overpriced, especially for what you got in the build quality. Over the last year, Teslas have taken a huge price hit, and Teslas as they stand today can be purchased for anywhere between twenty dollars to $30,000, if not less. And at that twenty dollars to $30,000 price point, Teslas become very, very attractive. And over the last six months or so, I've repeatedly said on my channel that I think that a $25,000 Tesla is one of the best cars that you can purchase for that price point. And so being as though I had been wanting to get a new personal car for a while and I knew I wanted to do this before summer hit because my 1997 Toyota 4Runner AC is lacking, I thought that this was the perfect time to pull the trigger. And last month, I bought a 2021 Tesla Model 3 Performance with 52,000 miles for $26,000. The car is in pretty much immaculate condition. It came with WeatherTech floor mats in the back seat, front, and trunk. The windows were tinted, as is the sunroof, and the car has a clear wrap up until the front door. And I've got to admit that I've been really impressed, and I'm really happy with my purchase overall. And so in this video, I want to break down my honest thoughts as somebody who has been an admitted Tesla skeptic, but is now a Tesla owner, and I want to talk about the things that I like, the things I don't like, the things I think are overrated, underrated, and overall some of the things that I've been either impressed or disappointed with. Now, the reason why I got a Model 3 Performance rather than just a standard or long range is because of trade and value. Overall, while I'm not betting for my Tesla to hold its value, because given the record of the last year, I doubt that it will, the Model 3 Performance does hold its value better than a standard range and even a bit better than long range, so I thought that this would be a safer bet because I don't plan on keeping this car forever. We bought this car for below market value, so we paid $26. The market value for this car was anywhere between $30,000 and $31,000. And given the fact that we do plan to sell this once the sixth generation foreigner comes out next year, this will hopefully protect us from an insane amount of depreciation. But we did pay cash for the car, so we don't have to worry about being underwater on a loan. And if it ends up depreciating more than we expect, then we'll probably just end up keeping the car and putting it on Turo. So we do have some backup plans in place in case this car does depreciate more than I expect it to. We also bought this car private party so it didn't qualify for any EV tax credits not only because it's not $25,000 but also because we bought a private party and not at a dealer. So first a few things that I like. I love the look of the car, both interior and exterior. I love the black on white, the sunroof, the interior. I went with black and I think that this was a great choice. Looks wise, there is really nothing that I dislike. I also love the space and practicality of the car. This is a car that you can take anywhere. It's a true daily driver and this is exactly what I was looking for. The front is great for everyday things. The back trunk has a ton of room and I love the bottom compartment. I consider this the perfect example of a practical luxury vehicle and this is something I really appreciate because I love and value practicality. Not to mention the ability for this car to be fast but also comfortable. Whenever it's in sport mode, it is incredibly fast. Like it is a competitor with my husband's GT500 which was way more expensive. But whenever I'm in chill mode, it feels just like any other luxury car and I really appreciate that because chill mode is what I drive it in the majority of the time. The speed factor is something that I think is cool but it's not something I'm particularly interested in and something that I drive every day. So this is truly the best of both worlds. I will say the build quality of the car is quite poor. And this is where Tesla fans typically come out in droves to defend the brand, and that's something I've never really understood. And I still don't understand, even as a Tesla owner that considers myself to be a pretty big fan of the car. Now, I will admit that for the most part, the build quality doesn't bother me a ton because this just isn't really something that I pay a lot of attention to, but it does bother my husband quite a bit. And truthfully, I can see his point. The carbon fiber spoiler on the back is flaking away as the clear was too thin, and on a three-year-old car, that's really unacceptable. When we bought the car, the taillight was broken because of condensation, and the trunk is not waterproofed well enough, and so when it rains, the car gets quite a lot of water in the lower trunk compartment. And from research that we've done, this is an issue that's very common in Teslas. Now, these are all things that my husband's going to fix, so they weren't deal breakers whenever we bought the car, but for a three-year-old car, I think they're pretty inexcusable. And a couple of weeks ago, my husband and I posted a TikTok breaking down everything wrong with our Tesla, and there were a number of people who commented saying that this is just expected with a used car, and that's just simply not true. I've purchased dozens of used cars, and even my older used cars haven't had this issue. In fact, of all of the cars that I've purchased, only one has had this problem with water getting into the vehicle, and it was 12 years old when it developed that issue. So 
this really isn't the byproduct of a used car. This is the byproduct of poor build quality. And while these are the major problems that we found with the car, we do have some minor ones as well. Interior panels do have some fitment issues. There are panel gaps throughout the car. Quite a lot of minor issues that don't really bother me, but had I bought this car new, I would be very irritated at these problems, but because I bought it used, I don't mind. I will say that one of the issues that I've pointed out in past videos of mine is the Tesla creaking and squeaking of the interior. Like you hit the dash and it's super squeaky, it's super creaky. In my month of ownership, I haven't noticed any type of interior creaking or squeaking. And aside from some fitment issues and some gaps in the interior, overall, I think the interior is really great quality and I think it's equal to anything that you'll find with any other manufacturer. One area that I am impressed with, but I still do have some complaints with, is the single screen. Not having a gauge cluster in front of me showing the speed actually doesn't bother me at all. It's a lot like a Toyota Yaris. In fact, you could say that the Toyota Yaris did it first. And things like AC control I've adapted to really quickly and haven't really had a problem with. I recently did a video about Fisker, and in that video, I talked about how one of the criticisms of Fisker is that the software feels incomplete. It feels like it's missing a lot of pieces and has holes in it. And whenever it comes to Tesla software, this is like the exact opposite. You can tell that Tesla put a ton of thought into their software. There's really nowhere where I think that they didn't think things through. I will say that the one thing that I really don't like, and it's really hard to get used to, is the lock and unlock button. The lock and unlock button in a Tesla isn't really easy to find. It's very small, and it isn't something that's super easy to get to without looking at it. In fact, the first few days that I had my Tesla, I didn't even know where it was, and every time I needed to unlock the car, I would just put it in park. I feel like from a safety perspective, I'd like for the lock button to be easier to find and for it to be a physical button or switch, like on the door next to the window switch. Because if there was a scenario where I needed to unlock or lock my car quickly, I feel like touching the screen in the area where it's at is harder to do than it needs to be. But all other buttons I'm okay without, which is something that did surprise me. The one thing that I absolutely hate, and it definitely is my biggest gripe with Tesla and my Model 3, is the subscriptions and upcharges. Full self-driving costs 12 grand, which is absurd. You can also buy it for $200 per month, which is also absurd, but this is probably something I'll do for one month to see how it is. Premium connectivity to listen to things like Apple Music or Spotify or to watch movies is $9.99 per month. But the most annoying thing that I feel like I've been most bitter about is MyQ, which is the garage door connectivity feature. MyQ is an app and device that you can connect to your garage to give you remote access to your garage. And to get this hooked up to your test it costs $45 per year or $175 for five years. And again, this allows for you to open your garage from your Tesla. You can also do schedules and it can also detect like when you're getting close to your garage. It has a handful of features. But what I find annoying about this is that I have my queue. I've had it for years and I've been using my phone to open up my garage door for a very long time now. And with my phone MyQ connectivity, you just have to buy the MyQ module and then the app is free. But even given the fact that I already have MyQ and I've had it for a very long time, I still couldn't add MyQ to my Tesla. If I wanted to add MyQ as my account currently stands to my car, I would have to pay $45 per year. Now, I could understand charging $45 per year if you didn't have the premium connectivity because I do understand that this device needs internet to work. But regardless of whether you have premium connectivity or not, it still costs $45 per year. And that's just something that really rubs me the wrong way and I absolutely refuse to buy it. I really hate these subscriptions and I know that this isn't something that only Tesla does. Automakers are doing it more often, but I really wish that Tesla owners and Tesla fans would really push back on this more than they are because maybe this is something that Tesla would reevaluate and change if enough customers threw up their arms about it. And again, while Tesla isn't the only company doing this, I do think that they're one of the more extreme examples. One thing that I am impressed with is the charging. I looked at buying a Tesla around this time last year, and at the time, I was under the impression that I would have to add a Tesla charger into my garage. And at the time, we got a quote for that, and it would cost six grand. And so because of that high cost, we decided that that just wasn't worth it and that we wouldn't get a Tesla. Now, obviously, I'm glad that we didn't end up getting one a year ago because Tesla prices have gone down 30% since then. But one of the reasons why I decided to finally pull the trigger on the Tesla is that I found out that I actually wouldn't need to install a Tesla charger and I could instead just use a standard wall outlet. Now, I don't drive a lot. I work from home and every area that I run is pretty much in a 10 mile bubble. And so for me, driving anywhere between 100 and 150 miles per week is pretty standard. And because of this, I can very easily use my wall outlet that's in my garage. It charges at five miles per hour. And even if I have a heavy driving day, my car is pretty much back to full within one to two days. I've been really impressed with the fact that I did need to install any additional charger and I can really effectively charge my car in my house, which is something that I really love. And to me, it's one of the bigger selling points of the car. I will say that overall, I've been very impressed. I do think that some of the issues with Tesla's like the leaky trunk and the money grab subscriptions are problematic. 
And I wish that Tesla cared more about fixing them, but based off of the Cybertruck complaints, I don't know that they have. But overall, I really do enjoy the car and I've been impressed, at least for being a Tesla owner for one month. And I again wholeheartedly believe that for that $25 to $30 price point, I really think that the Tesla can be beat. It is a huge bang for your buck. But like always, you guys, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, comments, if you have anything to add, I would love to hear it. So make sure to leave a comment down below. And while you guys are at it, make sure to hit the like button, hit that subscribe button, and hit the notification bell. And I will see you guys in the next video.